A summer of record-breaking heat is drying up rivers across Europe. Around half the continent is facing an unprecedented drought. Shipping companies in Germany are preparing for the worst as levels on the River Rhine drop to critical levels. Authorities say many vessels will be unable to navigate the key shipping route. If the water drops much lower, scientists warn climate change will lead to even more frequent periods of extreme heat and drought. DW Samantha Baker is at the Rhine in Cologne. Sam, just how bad is it where you are? The water levels here are extremely low. Uh, they're almost approaching record levels here in Cologne. So you can see around me, the, the banks here are creeping into the middle of the river. I mean, they're really expanding from, from where the water levels were earlier this summer. Uh, so like I said, this is reaching almost near record lows and it's affecting shipping, as you mentioned. So if the water is not a meter and a half high, these large ships can't navigate the Rhine, uh, which means they have to carry less goods, as little as 25 percent of what they were planning to carry, and that leads to delays in shipping and increased costs. Unfortunately, this situation isn't uh, forecast to change anytime soon. Those, lo those water levels aren't set to rise anytime soon. Sam, normally water levels only begin to drop from this time of year. How has it managed to get so bad so early? Well, climate change is certainly having an impact here on the drought across Europe, really. Uh, so we've seen prolonged periods of high temperatures this summer and not very much rainfall in the past few weeks. So that is just making the problem worse and worse. Um, so, you know, this, this impact is making droughts in general more intense, more frequent, more severe, uh, and, and it's leading to these really low water levels, not only here on the Rhine, but also on the Loire in France, on the Po River in Italy, on the Danube, really across the continent. Authorities say shipping on the River Rhine, where you are, might soon come to a standstill. What, what would be the economic impact of that? Yeah, so that will certainly impact businesses uh, here in Germany as well as a few other countries. Uh, most of Germany's goods are shipped on the Rhine, so it's going to have a big impact. In 2008, the last time that uh, water levels got this low, uh, it impacted Germany's GDP by 0.4%. Uh, Businesses are a little bit more prepared this time because they had that record year in 2018. Um, but, you know, it's it's to be seen. Usually these record lows come closer to October. So we've still got a ways to go in the season. So what can be done? So because this drought is made worse by climate change, the main thing is reducing uh, our greenhouse gas emissions, and that means stop using fossil fuels. Now, it's perhaps a bit ironic that many of the ships that go up and down this river behind me are carrying things like coal, heating oil, and diesel, and burning those fossil fuels is making the problem of climate change worse, which is making it harder for them to navigate this river due to low water levels and due to this drought. Uh, so that's the main thing to be done in the long term. Uh, short term, some of these companies, uh, you know, may need to find other ways to move their goods uh, if they can't get up and down the Rhine. DW Samantha Baker in Cologne. Thank you. Well, climate scientists say human activities have contributed to an increasingly warm planet. DW reporter William Glucroft has an overview of the extreme heat, catastrophic drought and record wildfires disrupting this European summer. The whole world is getting hotter, but data show Europe is outpacing the global average. And that's leading to conditions rarely seen in an otherwise temperate part of the world. Let's start with those wildfires that several European countries are battling. Now, this year has already been a record number of total fires since the European Union started keeping track in 2006. Now, here we can see those blazers have so far burned 660 thousand hectares of land. And if we compare it to the average to this point so far in the year, it's three and a half times more than the average over all of those years. Now, what is 660,000 hectares? Let's put that in perspective. That area is bigger than all of the city of Istanbul. And the fire season is not 
over yet. So what's making it so bad? Fire officials are pointing to extreme drought and high temperatures, which are only getting hotter. And it's not just about hot weather or one hot summer. It's about a trend. We can look at Germany as just an example. Germany is, of course, a fairly cool northern European country. You can see here average summer temperatures in Germany between 1960 and now, 2022. And yes, of course, there are some cooler years, but the trend is unmistakable. It's going up. It's getting warmer and warmer and warmer with every year, starting in 1960 with a temperature of just under 16 degrees Celsius. And this year, not yet over, we don't quite know, but we may be reaching almost 19 degrees Celsius with that high point back in 2003 at 19.67 degrees Celsius. And remember, these are just averages. These also include lows in the nighttime. Heat waves, hot days, and tropical nights are all on the rise. Now that has health consequences for people living in these more frequent and more intense conditions because the human body can't cool off and infrastructure that's made for a temperate zone like Northern Europe can't cope. But there's knock-on effects as well for all around the world. Higher temperatures and less water can reduce economic productivity, destroy agriculture, and make trade more difficult and expensive. And that makes climate change anywhere a problem for everyone, everywhere. William Klukroff there. The Netherlands, which borders Germany, is normally one of the wettest countries in Europe. But this summer, it's also battling a prolonged drought and water shortages. With just about a third of its land below sea level, the Netherlands is especially vulnerable to climate change and is now being forced to adapt fast. Kettle coming to a waterhole. The dried out reservoir just outside the Dutch town of Deventer. It's a very dry season now, and you can see the, the water level is very, very low. This canal would normally be bringing water into one of the Netherlands' biggest rivers. We are the, at the bottom of the Schibbeek. Normally there's a uh, meter water over here, but now you can see it's all, it's all gone. You can see a little bit of water over there, a few meters uh, upstream, but this is all gone. And that's the, the river the Isel, and you can see how low it's. Wineland is responsible for the upkeep of the dike system in this region. And the extreme heat is not only drying out the waterways, but also endangering his levees. Yeah, this would be all covered with grass, but now you can see it's, it's all dirt. So dry now. You need the grass cover because it's erosion blanket uh, top of the levee. Uh, yeah, you can see what the future would look like if it stays this better. The dike needs water for it to stay safe and Wijnand has to prepare for the changing conditions. We uh, look what, what plants uh, are going to um, be better at the drought with, with longer roots. We want to learn from southern parts of Europe too. We have to learn from it. Moving 90 kilometers westward on the outskirts of the city of Utrecht, the picture seems quite different. This pumping station is called the Aanvoerder, the supplier, and it's part of the uh, climate adaptation system that we use to get sweet water to the west of the Netherlands. But with the Rhine already running at extremely low levels, it looks to be helping one neighbor at the expense of another. Nature, agriculture and also the dikes need the water from the Rhine River. Because if this pump stops working, salt water from the sea will push into the coastal waterways. Jerome is looking at a complete reversal of Dutch water management. The history of the Netherlands is a history of uh, flood defense, uh, and that is how the Dutch built the Netherlands, uh, especially the western, western part, you know, below uh, the sea level. But we also now have to prepare for more drought and more warmth and more heat. However, central water distribution is of little help on the Reutert family farm. Normally the cows uh, all day walk outside and uh, take the grass outside. But now there's nothing growing so, uh, and cows uh, have to eat something. So uh, they stay inside and eat uh, all the grass from last year. And with his cornfields in his sorry state, farmer Willem Jan has little hope they can grow enough feed. When there's no rain that strays out, nothing grows. We will hope that it will rain. But the wait goes on. The forecast is expecting yet more dry and hot weather. 
I'm joined now from Delft in the Netherlands by Bart von der Hoek. He's a climate researcher at the Deltaris Institute. Professor, we heard it there in our report, the forecast is not good. How damaging do you think this hot, dry summer will be to the Netherlands? Well, this is indeed something we are not very uh, used to. I mean, as you heard from the video just before that we are a country that is prepared for floodings and we sort of have, have a heroic story about our country that we, we have defended ourselves against the, the, the sea and the rivers. But this is a drought situation that is, of course, yeah, uh, reaching us more and more often with a, with a change in climate. But we need to uh, inc uh, increasingly get used to it. And, and so we really need to, to adjust ourselves to this kind of situation for sure. What would be the uh, consequences, though, if uh, the Dutch don't uh, adapt in time? Well, that, that actually is no option because no one can live without water. So we'll, we'll, we'll adapt in one way or another. And, and you know, there is, we have had dry years for sure. And uh, we are currently in this year, we are not in, in a record year even. Uh, the 1976 is still, say, the most prominent uh, uh, drought year that we have experienced in modern history. But of course, our yeah, society has developed as well since then. Our, our uh, population has grown, economy has grown. So we are probably a bit more sensitive to, say, so these kind of conditions. But again, 2018 also was a year that was really, yeah, another kind of wake up call. And also because we had a, a sequence of dry years, uh, also 2019, 20 were relatively dry in the, in the, in the growing season. And that made us aware that, that this is something to stay and something to prepare for. And uh, yeah, and since then, we have, we have implemented quite a few measures, like uh, uh, more water retention. We've, we, we've, we've elaborated on, on the way we manage our fresh water reservoirs. We have a big lake uh, called Lake IJssel, which is covering 15% uh, of the Netherlands, say, to the north. And, and, and we manage it in order to have sufficient uh, amount of water. We also have a lot of uh, attention paying paid currently to, you know, uh, keeping water in the domain that, that uh, the whole domain of, of many of the areas were designed to to get rid of the water. We we drained areas to convert it into to uh, agricultural land, but now we realize we we need to keep the water in. So we've we've changed a lot of the natural flows and uh, and, and the water management in order to to have higher water levels throughout the year. Etc. Etc. So there's so many adaptation actions ongoing and and still to come. Uh, so no adaptation is not an option at all. Mm -hmm. uh, are some of those solutions, or, or all of those solutions, solutions that other countries can adapt. Sorry, uh, I couldn't get question. Yes. Uh, are those solutions that you just listed off uh, solutions that other countries can adapt to uh, oh, this uh, yeah, new yeah, normal? Yeah, yeah. Well, yes and no. I think um, we have a, a, a good tradition in water management, and that is both on the, the technical side, uh, say about the infrastructure, but also on the governance side. There's a lot of adaptation actually that is going about who is actually responsible for which part of the whole system and also the adjustment between uh, different government la layers and interactions with, with the users of the water. That's also a thing that has evolved over time. But I think we can also learn from from other countries on on our side. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, this is this is not a, a, a usual situation. This is not something we are really experienced to. And so, uh, and and there's other countries even within Europe where where I say climate is a bit different. In, in the, for instance, in Spain, we have a much uh, a very different say uh, 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 annual cycle of rainfall, and we know for sure that in in in, in large parts of the summer season there is no water at all. So you need to deal a lot on, on that water management already early in the year when there is still water. And, 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 and there, the, 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 say, uh, the, the negotiation process on who gets which part of the water, of course, takes place at the moment that, that you still can take some action, which is more like in, in, in early spring time. And, uh, and and those are uh, and and also in in all kinds of of, of say uh, more infrastructural arrangement about how to conserve water, how to maintain its quality, how to uh, uh, um, uh, the development of living with water, like mm -hmm. a development of housing on water or uh, agriculture that is more water resistance, whatever. Those are kinds of practices that we definitely learn from other countries, I would say. Can I just ask you briefly, though, uh, how, how the problems here in Europe caused by extreme heat compared to other parts of the world? 
Well, yes, that's that's a good question. I, I've been involved in the uh, latest IPCC uh, climate change assessment um, in the in the in the physical uh, report that was released last uh, last year in August, and there we, we we get a global picture of what climate change is doing, and uh, for sure we uh, uh, Europe is uh, is is exposed. To increasingly to also drought problems. For sure, the Mediterranean area is, uh, is 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 really a hot spot for this. But we also see at our say mid latitudes where Germany and, uh, and the Netherlands are, the, the the risk of these kinds of events is increasing. So this all what we are seeing now sort of fits the picture. But I'm really you know sometimes astonished by the pictures I see from, for instance, the Middle East or countries like Iraq or mm-hmm. or the. In China, currently, we have a nine-week-long heat wave with with days and days or even weeks and weeks where regions, uh, the temperature uh, is exceeding 35, 40 degrees uh, during wow. daytime. And that is that is getting incredibly uh, difficult to, mm-hmm. yeah, almost to survive in, in yeah. a climate like that. In, in the south of Iraq, uh, Basra, I, I was told uh, the other day that, that we have 52 degrees centigrade on midday, <clears> and it's Cooling, cooling to not cooler than 35 degrees in, in during nighttime. So there's no way people can recover. Well, that is, yeah, that definitely, is about it. It definitely sounds like a, a global phenomenon, that's for sure. But von der Herk, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting okay. stuff. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, those low water levels across Europe are also making it harder to cool power stations. In France, it's creating a particular headache for the country's nuclear power industry. Nuclear reactors produce around 70% of the country's power. And many of those reactors depend on huge quantities of water from nearby rivers to cool them down. Strict rules aimed to protect aquatic life govern how much hot water can be re-released downstream. But due to France's current energy crunch, many nuclear stations have received special permits to keep running, something that's making environmentalists worried. DW's Lisa Lewis reports now from southwestern France. France has been baking in temperatures of up to 40 degrees for months now. That is putting French nuclear plants under strain. Authorities are having to bend the rules for about a fifth of them, just to keep them running. Usually, nuclear power plant operators are only allowed to discharge their cooling water into rivers like the Garonne if the river's temperature is under a certain limit. That is to protect the local flora and fauna. Currently though, authorities have suspended that rule at certain reactors like the Golfesh plant here behind me. They say it's the only way to guarantee France's power supply. But these environmental activists are outraged that rules are being suspended for nuclear power plants when river systems are already under stress in the heat and drought. They say warming them up even more is disastrous. It's a catastrophe for plants and fish. Some of them die, which has ripple effects throughout the whole food chain. When, for example, there are no microalgae, certain small fish die that are normally food for bigger fish. Plus, warmer water contains more bacteria. In order to make it potable, we have to add a lot of chemicals, which people then drink. But with half of all reactors closed for maintenance, France desperately needs the ones that are running to keep going. Power company EDF, which declined our request for an interview, has called the situation extraordinary. And yet, the current issues don't seem to be an existential problem for French nuclear power. The government is about to nationalize EDF and plans to build new reactors. This energy expert says betting heavily on nuclear for energy is not a good strategy, especially in the short run. New nuclear plants can't be commissioned in the short term as their technology is not ready yet. Renewables are different. They have become cheaper and cheaper over the past few years and could be deployed immediately across the country. Uh, 
neighboring countries will be watching closely. Until now, France has been Europe's biggest net energy exporter. This year, though, the country will have to import more electricity than it's exporting. Let's get some analysis. I'm joined by Professor Thorsten Wagner. He's a water expert from the University of Potsdam. Professor, how worried are you about the current low river water levels we are seeing across Europe? Well, we see another stress test to the water system in Europe. And we currently find all the, the problem points. We've seen some in 2018 already, but as your report already said, then the the dry points, the low points in the rivers were later in the year, in October, and now they're even earlier. And we might see problems with shipping, which is already reduced and might even come to a halt in parts of Germany and parts of Europe. Hmm. Now, the drought is having a serious impact on uh, uh, various industries. You mentioned shipping there. Uh, which ones are struggling the most? It's not just shipping, is it? No, it varies across Europe. We um, see that in, in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy, agriculture is, is in huge trouble. We see that in France, energy production is in trouble because it needs water from the rivers for cooling and it can't take enough to produce energy. In Germany, we see partially the shipping. Um, in the UK, we see groundwater levels falling. So it's all across Europe and depending on where water is used most in, in different countries, we see the problem areas occur. Mm. So mm. how long do you see this drought to go on? Well, it will last a bit longer. We will have thunderstorms and small periods of rain, but that is not going to be enough to wetten up the soil so that it can even receive really the water that the soil needs and that the groundwater needs. Um, we probably are into September when at least the forecast at the moment suggests that it might become more normal conditions again. And then we will look for prolonged periods of rain to um, recover the system. Now, what is the role of climate change in the extreme dry and hot season we are seeing this summer? Well, it's very clear that with increasing climate change, we will see increasing occurrence of these extremes, um, dry, more intense periods, more regular periods of dry summers. Um, often, or we, we hope that they will be balanced a little bit by wetter winters, but if the winters are also dry, as we've seen now, then um, we can see how troublesome that is. And what we really see is how, what 1.5 degrees or some number of climate change that is maybe a bit abstract for people, mm. what that actually means for us mm. uh, through these kinds of droughts. Now, uh, climate change, uh, fighting climate change, of course, is a very, very long-term game. Uh, in the short term, what can be done to help countries across Europe? Well, this, this kind of stress test to the system that we see right now tells us how quickly certain areas get into trouble. Farming, we've started talking about the Po River a few weeks ago where farming um, is very water intensive with rice and uses surface water, so that's very fragile. We have other areas that need a prolonged, more prolonged period of drought before, before they get into trouble. What we need to see now is where we can adapt, either to different crops, where we can buffer the system, maybe for shorter or longer periods for reservoirs, and where we really have to change our approach. Um, the shipping is, is one good example because even a few years ago, people realized how fragile it actually is um, and started changing the system because certain goods could only be transported by river. And we see what kind of impact that has on the GDP, as your report said. Professor Torsten Wagner, thank you very much. Thank you.